Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. I'm honored to be here. This is a wonderful space to have the opportunity to speak into. So I thank you, Wanderlust, and I thank you, Hay House, Molly, all the people who are, who are here in this room. Join with me, please. Let's take a deep breath. We close our eyes. <clears throat> and as we close our outer eye, we open our inner eye. And we see in the middle of our mind a little ball of golden light. And we watch this light as it begins to grow larger and larger. Until now, it covers the entire inner vision of our mind. And we see for ourselves within this light a beautiful temple. And we see a garden that surrounds the temple and a body of water that flows through the garden. We see that the inside of the temple is lit by the same beautiful golden light. And here we are. For we have been drawn together by the power and in the presence of the divine. And it is to that that we devote our time spent together and our experiences of one another. May we be lifted above and beyond the fears and limitations, the dis-ease of this world, to the love and to the peace that lay beyond. And so it is. Amen. <clears throat> I think when we think about coming to an event like this, with our conscious minds, we are thinking about what we're going to get from it, the classes we're going to attend, the experiences that we're going to have. But I think on a subconscious level, we come to an event like this because we know on some level that there is a great gathering there is a great accumulation of collective energy, a morphic field that is being created in a kind of collective yoga, as it were. I know my friend Sean Korn was speaking here yesterday. She's got that organization, that wonderful work that she's doing off the mat and into the world. And, Ma, and uh, Kareem was mentioning earlier the event Sister Giant uh, going on in Los Angeles, very similar aligned uh, works, and she was talking about the blowback that she's gotten from many people who don't want to hear her talk about going out into the world and being activists or being political because they feel their yoga pra practice is something so personal and so within. So what I want to talk to you about today is how we align the outer world and the inner world in all aspects of our lives and where the practice of yoga and the practice of the spirit is something that both propels us outward in a certain way and then infuses everything we do when we do go out into the world. <clears throat> you know, if you look at the symbolism of both the Christian cross and the Jewish star of David, they are both visual symbols of the intersecting point between the spirit and the earth. So the horizontal axis of the earth plane intersects the vertical axis of the divine and the relationship to the divine. Now, the great spiritual avatars are people who embodied the intersection. There is a line about Jesus in A Course in Miracles where it says, he lived on the earth but thought the thoughts of heaven. So as anyone knows who practices yoga or anything like this, the issue is how to be so deeply into our bodies that counterintuitively we are lifted more easily out of the body. You know when you see a good ballet dancer, you go, wow, it's amazing what the body can do. When you see a great ballet dancer, it's something beyond the body. Good sex, what the body can do. Great sex, what body? <laughs> And so there is a way in which we actually use the body to be lifted to a place, and that's also counterintuitively. The Course in Miracles talks about how physical health 
The way to be physical healthy, uh, physically well, is to know that you are in your body, but you are not of your body. Now, this intersection point between the internal experience of yoga or anything like yoga, and then out, what do we do, and should we even think in terms of going out into the world? Well, from A Course in Miracles perspective, we're taught about how, yes, you meditate, yes, you become peaceful, yes, you find that inner temple place, because that's what we're talking about here, right? We're talking about the consciousness of the temple, the consciousness where the energies are correct. And you go to a yoga class, and it's easier to do, not only because of an instructor, not only because of your own practice, but because you're with other people who are doing the same. It's not always easy to stay aligned when we then exit that room and go out into the chaos of the world. But it is actually, if you think about it, ultimately selfish if we think of our spiritual practice as only something we do for ourselves. The point is that, yes, you, can't, you don't spend all day in your yoga practice. You don't spend all day in your meditation. However, the point for the adept is to carry it with us when we go out into the world to be at a point, as we know, where when we go out into the world, we carry the temple space with us. Everything we do is infused with the consciousness with which we do it. It's not just what we do in the world today, it's who we are while we are doing it. And what's happening in terms of yoga, yoga is certainly an example, but there are many spiritual practices that are part of this entire vibrational uplift that is occurring. The Course in Miracles says that ideas grow stronger when they're shared. So, and we all know this, who've ever been to a yoga class or a group meditation or a Course in Miracles group or what, whatever our spiritual practice is, there's something that happens when you're doing it in a room with other people. And there's this collective, this morphic field. So then the question becomes, not only what is our responsibility inwardly as individuals when we leave the practice and go out into the world to carry the peace with us, but also the question that is really a burningly crucial uh, question for all global citizens today is what about how we are collectively when we go out into the world? The reason this matters is because if you look at all of the people um, who practice yoga, the scores of millions of people who practice yoga, the scores of millions of people who do meditative and spiritual practice and are on some kind of a spiritual path, this is force. Now, I, I want to stop for a moment on that issue of force. Sometimes we think of force as a, a, as a bad thing. No, force is not always a bad thing. When you look at a tiny little blade of grass <clears throat> and you had an electron microscope and you saw it come up out of the dirt, you know, it would one day be a huge, huge tree, but it begins as just a little blade of grass, right? Well, if you look at this from an electron microscope, you would see that to the dirt around it, it was an aggressive act, right? So anytime we experience extend ourselves. If I'm just looking at you, I'm not exerting force. But if I ask you, can I, can I do something for you? Can I help you? There is an exertion of energy outward. It, the world is this constant yin and yang of inner and outer. And if we only take, you know, sometimes in a yoga class, you're in a position and you're, you're aware that you're, you can feel yourself bringing down the light. Right? You can, can feel yourself bringing down the light. And then we say things like, I am feeling at one with the universe. And, and we do feel at one with the universe. But notice where even though that is a physical, you know, if I'm in a position, it's a physical experience of at one with the universe. Let's use our intelligence here. If I'm one with the universe, that would mean I'm one with the earth. If I'm one with the universe, I'm one with all living things. So if I'm one with the universe, what does that mean about my oneness with a starving child? Because since we've been in this room today, Every four seconds, a child on this earth dies of starvation. 17,000 children on this earth die of starvation every single day. And I, I, I think about that not only in terms of the pain and the suffering of a starving child, but the pain and the suffering of a mother who's watching her child starve, or a father who's watching his child starve. 
of what it must be like to be a parent whose child is saying, Mommy or Daddy, I'm hungry, and they have nothing to give them. So when you think of the 17,000 uh, children who are dying of starvation today, but that's a lot more than 17,000 who are living in immense human suffering. So if we are one with the universe, what well, we're one with the universe, but that means everything and all living things except the starving children. I was looking at an article about fracking. Are they doing fracking in Canada? Yes. I didn't get that yet. Is that a yes or no? Yeah. You know, if it, I, I've, in, my, in my work, I have counseled sometimes young people who cut. And when young people are cutting, we get that that's a pathology. It's a pathology. So when we think of fracking, <clears throat> if you were to stand back and look at it and look at the behavior of the human race, as Gandhi said, the problem with the world is that humanity is not in its right mind. So if you stand back and you look at fracking, it's a lot like cutting. It's a lot like cutting. It's this unbelievable violation of the body if, to the extent to which the earth is the body of, of the human race and represents it. And you can, we can talk about how it's irresponsible, but at the deepest level, it's insane. <coughs> And so what's happening in the world today is that people are seeking in yoga and in spiritual practice a place to get out of the insanity. And it's very important that we do. I don't know how people are making it today who do not have a spiritual practice. And of course, we know the answer to that. And that's at least in the United States, I assume in Canada, to certainly some extent, the huge success of the pharmaceutical companies as they make sure that an antidepressant to the best of their ability gets put in the hands of every man, woman, and child. In the United States, we have a, a, something called the National Rifle Association, which isn't happy unless a gun is in the hands of every man, woman, and child. Pharmaceuticals won't be happy until an antidepressant is in the hands of every man, woman, and child. So we have this situation where clearly the light that we seek to bring down, and that we not only seek to bring down attitudinally, but that's the beauty of something like yoga. You know, The Course in Miracles talks about how enlightenment begins as an abstract intellectual construct but through meditation and through yoga and through whatever practice we're all involved in, we actually feel it enter and then move down, take that journey without distance. If we only stay in the temple, for those of you who have read the, um, the Dostoevsky uh, novel Brothers Karamazov, it begins with a famous uh, scene in which the, the, man who has been in a, the young man who has been in a monastery for a long time, he doesn't want to go out. He says, I just want to stay here. It's so peaceful. It's so loving. And uh, he is told by his superiors, no, you must go out. Because we are sent out into the world. That is not to be contrary to our practice, but in order to take the gifts of our practice with us. We don't leave the practice. And everybody knows that. Your body retains its, its alignment. Now, what, what do we then do? We say, OK, now, and it's, it's a conundrum, because you say, I don't want to go out into a world, the politics where they're talking about starving children. I don't want to go out into the world where they're talking about things like fracking. I don't want to go talk about child poverty. I don't want to go talk about all these things, because then it will knock me out. That's toxic and negative, and I don't want to be there. There's nothing unspiritual about yelling fire if the house is burning down. <laughs> okay, let's be real clear about that. So you say, I don't want to get out of my, of my positive space and go out there and be active in the world. What's so positive about that level of selfishness? There's nothing positive about that. This, the alignment of body and soul is, I'm going in there, but I'm going in there as who I am. I am going in there from this place, and when I am there, I will not be knocked out of my center, because what I receive in that center is my gift to that gestalt. And the only reason why that gestalt, for instance, politics is so dark and toxic and mean, the only reason it is that way is because it's not centered in the energies of light that we all embrace. So uh, we can say, OK, I'll just leave it alone. But if we just leave it alone, all that will happen is that it will get more and more toxic. And the effects on this universe that we're one with are very intense indeed. So we're living at a time where not in an institutionalized way, thank goodness, not in an organized way, thank goodness, except to the extent to which it's necessary. Something like Sean's organization off the mat and into the world, something like Sister Giant uh, in the US. 
these, these impulses are arising from us, but we don't mean to be going out into the world from the old consciousness. Rather, the issue now is for us to become the people. You know, the Course in, in, in Gandhi said that the end is inherent in the means. And we all know the line how he said, we must be the change we wish to see happen. But that wasn't the end of his sentence. You know, that line is often taken out of context. Because a lot of people use that as cover for just sitting here. I must be the change I want to see happen. As though if I am the change, that is enough. But even though all minds are joined and being the change is huge, the alignment of body and soul is that as we then go out into the world as the change, we engage the world in a different way. What we engage, we transform. And only what we engage, we can transform. And that which we engage with our hearts is transformed forever. So I, I, I open this conversation today in order for us to be able to then talk about the specifics. For some of us, it's our work lives. For some of us, it's our romantic lives. For some of us, it's our relationship with money. For some of it's our relationship with politics. To enter into a conversation about how do we dwell within the inner temple? How do we dwell within the alignment and yet deal with the chaos of the world? You know. I'm involved in a project right now where this has been very, um, uh, very in my face in that if you only stay in your own circle, if you only stay in your own temple space, life is so sweet and life is so peaceful. The problem is at a certain point your conscience will not allow you to turn away from some of the problems in the world that will only be solved through some level of collaborative effort. You know, the beauty of yoga is <laughs> you don't have to talk to anybody. It's when we have to engage. It's when we have to engage with other people that sometimes, you know, it's so easy to smile at the person and, you know, I'm in bliss and you're in bliss and I'm in bliss and you're in bliss and I'm in bliss and you're in bliss. And what you know deep in your heart it's really nice I'm not having to talk to her. It's really nice. <laughs> That's, but that's where the rubber meets the road. And in our spiritual uh, journey to enlightenment, and self -act which is self-actualization, the universe is not going to let it be that easy. So within that, we have two uh, mic runners. I don't know exactly where they are. But I'd like you to bring up topics, uh, bring up situations, bring up questions. And I will, to the best of my ability, reflect on this from the perspective of how we stay within the temple and the alignment vertically because that's really the point what yoga does is it aligns us vertically but when I said before that Star of David and, and the Christian cross you see really the issue is the intersection of the vertical alignment with the horizontal alignment and that's where we are now which includes like I said the intersection of the individual stance and the collaborative collective effort okay let's talk about whatever you want to talk about yes over there hi if you're in a good space it means um, that you're not always dealing with your shadow and I found that um, practicing yoga has forced me to look at my shadow uh -huh. and then you forced to look at um, the shadow in the outside world as well. So how can yoga help with uh, dealing with your shadow? Love brings up everything unlike itself is basically what you just said. The closer we get to the enlightenment uh, state uh, within ourselves, what happens is that healing is a kind of a detox. Everything comes up in order to be released. And I, in the situation I just mentioned where I see that once you start working with people <clears throat> in, in group settings that happens, it's because collectively that occurs as well. So the issue is to not, however, romance the shadow. You know, there's too much in the higher consciousness community these days of I have to get in touch with my darkness. Yeah, you need to get in touch with your light too. <laughs> so the issue of the shadow, the issue of all the shadow is is the unhealed aspects of self. So it comes up through a kind of detox and it's a good thing that it comes up because it has been running the show anyway. It's just that we were so anesthetized to our own circumstances that we didn't see it. In other words, if I had all these unhealed energies, it was sabotaging and undermining my best efforts. I just didn't see it. So the value of it coming up and being right in my face is that then I get to, number one, surrender it 
to the transformative power, whether you call it the Holy Spirit or whatever words you have, as it says in the Course in Miracles, do not try to purify yourself before coming to me. I am the purifier. So you say, wow, I really have anger. Wow, I'm really needy. Wow, I, I really fudge the truth there. Wow, I really procrastinate. Wow, I'm really judgmental. Wow, I'm really critical. Whoa. <laughs> right? And then you say, dear God, take these from me. I release these and I ask to be healed. Then what happens? Because the universe loves you so much, <clears throat> you will find that the next situation you're in, and the one after that, and the one after that, will tempt you into your worst behavior. That is how much the universe loves you. <clears throat> the universe is intentional. Your self-actualization is its goal. So you will be brought into situations, and you will, number one, be tempted into that behavior. But number two, since this work is going on, even you have to see it. Now, what happens in the shadow? The shadow is a simply a place. I mean, we give it that romantic word. What it really means is it's a place where I don't know how to extend love and get my needs met. I had a childhood. <laughs> that's all that's going on here. It's that triggered place where I would be nice to you, I would be kind, I would be integrous, I would be ethical, I would be loving. But in this moment, a wire is crossed. And in this moment, on some triggered internal level, I don't know how to do that and feel like I'm getting my needs met. So I go into survival and go into behavior that actually is going to ensure that I don't get my needs met, but my conscious mind cannot see that at the moment. So what the universe is doing is, is bringing it writ large so that I see what I'm doing while I'm doing. The first step is you get into, which is, I'm not enlightened enough to not be feeling this yet, but I'm enlightened enough on the path to get that I'm feeling it. Wow. So the first time you actually still feel it, still act on it, but kind of know you're insane while you're doing it. The next, and then you see the consequences, and you're more adept at going, oh my God, that was me, I did that. Then the next time it comes up, you're saying, okay, I still, I'm not, I'm not evolved enough, I haven't been healed, I've, because once again, like I said, you've given this, dear God, take these from me, take these character defects from me. Next time it comes up, you're triggered into that behavior, you realize, wow, I'm feeling this, but wow, I don't have to act on it. Now, this is where yoga comes in. When you do physical exercise, just regular, let's say, weights and stuff, the physical exercise is so that I have the strength to go out there and do things. Meditation is to develop the musculature that I'm strong enough to just sit there and not be reactive and to have impulse control. There are two sets of muscles. The outer muscles is so that I can be strong in my ability to go out and do things. My internal muscles are I can be strong enough to not be reactive, not to have impulse control and to be able to sit still. Yoga is a magnificent inter intersection of both. What yoga does is both builds our muscles, enabling us to go out and do, and also builds the internal muscle, giving us the opportunity to sit still within ourselves, right? Okay, now that second time that shadow is triggered. It comes up and I have this feeling still, but remember I'm doing this work, I'm seeing it myself, I've asked it to be purified and through the grace of God, by whatever words I use that, Wow, I'm still feeling it, but I'm not going to push the send button. I'm not going to send this email. Wow, I'm still feeling it, but I have some self-control here. Whoa, I don't have to. I don't have to send that text. I don't have to pick up the phone. I'm still feeling it, but my, I'm becoming internally strong. I'm not acting on it. And ultimately, it comes up. Because the next time it comes up, and then you start imitating enlightened behavior. Okay? At first it is, you know, they say in AA, it's easier to act yourself into a new way of thinking than it is to think yourself into a new way of acting. So then you get to the point of, okay, what would a really cool, not needy person say here? <laughs> you know, and the universe probably showed you one earlier in the day. You know, because the universe is giving you whatever you need to, to go, okay, sh she didn't react, okay, don't react. And you start, and then ultimately, you begin to embody it. That's what transformation is. And the day comes when you don't even, you, that doesn't even come up in you anymore. You have been healed in that area. So you went from it coming up in you and you acting dysfunctionally because that, your behavior just came from your impulse, 
to praying, asking for divine help in, because if you're talking about things like this, shadow, it's not as easy as, just don't think that, <laughs> right? So then it gets to that point of the, of the, I'm feeling it, but I'm not acting on it. Then I'm actually acting a new way, but I'm a little clumsy because this is new. It's like a suit of clothes. I don't really fit in yet. And then I'm actually, I've been healed. It's a miracle. I'm not even going there in my mind anymore. I have been given on all different levels the information that I need. It doesn't matter. My mother didn't love me, that my father didn't love me because God loves me. Whatever your system is, however spirit gets to you. And then, this is what's really magnificent. The story of the prodigal son. The story of the prodigal son is that the father was more happy to see the son who left than the son who never left. The son who left and came home. Now, what does that story mean? Rajneesh, the Indian uh, guru, was asked, what does that mean, God loves a sinner? Which is what the story of the prodigal son is. And his response was, they tend to be more interesting people. <laughs> <laughs> so the beauty of this is, the beauty of this is, and you know when a, when a bone is broken and it comes back together, it's actually stronger than it was before. So in these areas where we got it wrong and then we're healed, you have, you're even, there's something, a, you, you have a moral authority when you talk about the issue. Let's say um, you... Uh, this would be a perfect example, actually, because I'm older than you are. So let's say that you were sitting in my, we were doing a session about a romantic relationship. And I was counseling you and I was suggesting that you really not call him five times a day. It won't be helpful, <laughs> right? There's something that you're going to get from me that could only have come from me if there had been a time in my life when I did call him five times a day and I no longer do. Does that make sense? And we, anybody in recovery knows that. Somebody who's been through it. So, when, so the universe uses everything. It's a perfect ecosystem. So even the places where we have had to recognize our own darkness, the point is the detox happens, it comes up, and then we are even more shining in those places. Does that make sense? And then the other thing, and this has to do with that collaborative issue, is understanding that not only is my shadow coming up, but it's all a part of my healing. So is yours. And by the way, I have to be in my ego to point out your ego. So if I'm pointing out your shadow, I'm in my shadow. Because only my shadow points out your shadow. <laughs> right? Does that make sense? Okay, who's next? Yes. <clears throat> Hi, thank you. Um, okay. I wasn't raised on any religion, mm -hmm. so there's some language that's lost on me, so I've discovered God through my own processes and had some detoxing. Through, through what, ma'am? Through my own uh, journeys and uh -huh. processes, and without little guidance. But where I'm confused is I have this way that I access God and I go inward, and that's where I connect. And I often see and hear people talking about God being out there and I don't get it. I'm, I'm just, I, just really, I just really need an, an answer on that. Well, those who are into a metaphysical, spiritual orientation know that the reason there's no God out there is because there is no out there. <laughs> Time and space are all parts of the illusion of consciousness. Not only is God not outside me, you're not outside me. The idea of spirit is that there is no place where one of us stops and one of us starts, and there is no place where we stop and God starts. So when people talk about up here, God and heaven, the pointing is to our own higher consciousness. No different than in yoga when you're being pulled up, to the higher consciousness, higher thought forms. And heaven is the awareness of our oneness. So yes, there are a lot of increasingly old-fashioned so-called religious perspectives which speak of a God out there. But when you're talking about the higher consciousness community, yoga and so forth, we're not talking about a God who is out there. We're talking about God who is in here. Does that make sense? And ultimately, <clears throat> belief in God is irrelevant. The experience of God is what's relevant. 
and the experience of God is our love for each other. One of the lines that uh, in Les Miserables, there's a line, to love another person is to see the face of God. And there's a line in The Course in Miracles where it says, some people um, conspire with God who do not yet believe in him. What, you know, there are people who, in the name of God, kill people. And there are people who claim to be atheists who live lives of deep love. It, it, you know, and there's nobody up there going, oh my God, get the words right. <laughs> God doesn't have an ego by which to be offended, you know, except by lovelessness, and even that is not offended, but sees it for what it is. Does that make sense? Okay. Yes, over there. <clears throat> okay, this seems a little bit different than what we've been talking about, but I think um, my greatest challenges recently have come from trusting myself to deal with either my children or even when you talk about hunger, uh, enabling versus empowering. Mm -hmm. You know, like, so when you talk about the hungry children, you know, the, the solution really isn't just the food, right? It's that that gives you relief. Like, it's like, like if you go on a vacation to Mexico or something and you're surrounded by it and, and you're tempted to, or I was tempted to, or not tempted, I, you know, you just, you do things, you give, you give, your, you give the burrito you're eating to somebody, you know what I mean? But you know you haven't, you haven't impacted it. So I was just interested in your thoughts on that, because when you, you said something about when we work together collaboratively, whether it's politics or any of these things, because I look at it from my adult children, who I'm tempted to throw money at their situations, and I know I'm not, I know I'm, uh, it just, that feels, doesn't feel healthy. Okay, I understand, and I am a mother. And um, obviously with our own children, uh, part of empowering them is not just throwing money at them, particularly when they get to a certain age. I mean, it's called weaning you off this, you know. So I, I, I understand that as a mother. But when you're talking about, remember there's a difference between hunger and starvation. Canada doesn't have starvation. The United States doesn't have starvation. We have hunger in the United States. I think you probably have some hunger in Canada. You have a much lower poverty rate, but we have hunger. In places like Africa, South America, there you're talking about starvation, the bottom billion on the earth. And I don't think that we are, I, I think it's a very uh, unattractive face of the white Westerner that we would even think about a mother whose child is starving in her arms and say, well, I don't want to enable you. I mean, come on. So we want to, I, I don't see anything wrong. You know, as parents, we have this fierce thing that comes up in us sometimes, and most parents have been there, where something happens and you say to your children, that will not happen in this house. And it, you're kind of laughing inside because you really don't know what you would do if they challenged that. But you have this face that you have on when you say that, that will not happen, young lady, in this house. And they go, whoa, right, that's that face. We need to become that way about this earth. Because you know what? Women are here to be mothers. It's just that every child on this planet is one of our own. And we are here to be the homemakers. It's just that the earth itself is our home. And we do need a fierce voice that says about starving children, about the fact that a billion people live on a dollar and less a day, that another billion after that lives on two dollars and less a day. We do need a voice that says that will not happen in this house. We do need that. Now, once people have what they need in order to survive. Then, you, then it's a different conversation. Like I'm not, you know, I have no problem with saying that a person has to climb up the rung of the ladder of success themselves. But there are times when the child is so tiny, society has to put the child on the first rung of the ladder because he or she is too tiny to get up there by themselves. I don't have a problem with saying that man has a, a woman has to pull him or herself up by her bootstraps if they have boots if they have a reasonable chance at boots. So that's the distinction, whether it's our children or whether it's the children of the world or the society. Yeah, talk about how people do it for themselves, it, but not when they're in such survival mode, especially because of systemic issues. 
on the part of the society. You know, I, I can't speak to Canada, I don't know. But I know in the United States there are very real reasons in terms of social and political and economic policies why so many people are desperately poor. And when our only view is, well, you know, they're just going to have to bring themselves up. It's just not helping them to throw money at them while we are throwing money at the very richest among us. That's obscene. Does that speak to that? And as mothers, we know that we, you know that place where it's it. You know, if you just keep my daughter's 22, it's that period where you know that's empowering her not to. Pay. Cool. Yes, in the back there. <clears throat> Thank you, Marianne. Uh, my question is about how do we bring light to these issues without taking on, because when I think about starving children, I get very sad and, and angry at the situations that cause that. So how do we bring light to it without <coughs> taking on or not sort of fueling yes. the anger and the suffering right. that's behind it? Very important question. But first of all, let's look at the word anger. Moral outrage is not born of anger. It's born of love. You know, when you see a mama bear or a tigress or a lioness and how fierce, you know, a common anthropological characteristic of all advanced mammalian species who survive and thrive is the fierce behavior on the part of the adult female of the species when she senses a threat to her cubs. You know how a, a bear gets, a mama bear gets if she senses you're messing with her cubs or a or a mama, tiger, or lioness. Now, if you see on a National Geographic special, let's say, the way the, the bear gets if she thinks you're messing with her cub, we don't look at that mama bear and go, I think she's strident. <laughs> I think she's got anger work she needs to do. <laughs> the complacency, our complacency in the face of such immense amount of human suffering that's what's negative. The relative complacency, that's the sickness, that's the shadow. Now, with our anger, the whole idea of the anger, you know, the Course in Miracles says there are only two emotions, love and fear. That all quote unquote negative emotions derive from fear. What are you afraid of? And you really get that you are sad and you are hurt. But you know, I, whenever these kind of situations come up for me, I think of the Olympic athletes. I am so impressed by a great athlete. But one of the things that I find most impressive about great athletes is not just what they do with their bodies, but their amazing psychological and emotional discipline. Let's say I'm a tennis player. I've worked all, practically my whole life to get at the Olympics, or I'm a, or I'm a swimmer, or I'm an I'm a, a ice skater, and I just made a mistake that, like, somebody just starting out wouldn't make. I cannot indulge 0.0001% of a fraction of a second to bemoan it. I don't have time. No time to indulge that. And I watch these athletes who make mistakes. You just know they want to just, ugh, but they, they have been trained. You can't. You can't indulge the emotion. And that's how we have to be. I remember once my sister worked with uh, autistic children, severely autistic children. And once when I was in high school, one summer I was helping her. And there was a severely autistic child. And it was, was so horrifying that I, I ran into the bathroom. A few, a few seconds later, the door, my, my sister just slammed the door. Where are you? Get back in there, because I left this child alone. And I said, um, I said, I just can't do it. It's too horrible. I just felt it's too horrible. I feel so sad for that. And my, my sister, she said to me, listen to me. He doesn't need your pity. He needs your help. He doesn't need your self-indulging, your emotional stuff. That child needs your help. Get back in there. And so you begin to see that it's our own lack of emotional and psychological self-discipline, which once again, once we see ourselves as parents, you know, we're all parents, part of a maturity of consciousness, regardless of whether we ever have children or not. It's almost irrelevant. Part of right-mindedness is knowing that care for future generations and the larger narrative of how life has come into us from others and now moves through us into 
those behind us who will be here when we go. That's, there is no higher consciousness without that realization of your place in the universe. So that's all part of the process that you come to see as your own self-indulgence. Martin Luther King said, you have very little morally persuasive power with people who can feel your underlying contempt. So if I have contempt for the people who disagree with me, and I have that in my consciousness, they subconsciously feel it. So that's the way in which healing ourselves of our own lower energies is part of the work that we then take out. Does that make sense? And there are a lot of hours in the day. You do the work and you cry. But I know when I was very, very, very active in the, in the AIDS crisis, and I found from that that hope is born of participation in hopeful solutions. I was in there with it every day, and I was doing less emotionalizing around it than more people that weren't involved in trying to help. There's something that happens, because when you're actually involved in trying to ameliorate a situation, it's counterintuitive, but it's when you're in some way extending yourself in a way that could help, that you also see the gifts of it, and the nobility of people, and the beauty, and you're more alive, and if you're outside the system, you're more likely to get lost in the emotions that, uh, that purport the ego would have you think are how much you care, but really are an excuse for not helping. Mm. That's just a very clever ego. It's just, I'm too sensitive. I just can't stand seeing all that. <laughs> <laughs> yes. It's because I'm sensitive. <clears throat> yeah. Sorry. Are we okay? Yes. Okay. <clears throat> okay. Thank you. Um, I was just wondering if you could take it to the, the kitchens of, the, of, the, of our world in terms of those of us who are parenting and will be parenting and really um, extending this um, as teaching to our children and you know also share what you've learned and how to control, you know, your judgments or your overguidance, you know, those kind of things. In terms of healthy eating, habits. natural eating? In terms of um, parenting, you know. Well, we wait, you said into, so into the kitchen, you were just talking. I just into the home. Oh, know, into the into home. Into the home, like, you know, to, 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 to raise children who can live with some of right. these principles. Well, you know, the Jesuits said, give me a child until he's five and he's mine. And as a mother, I really, really get that that's correct. Um, having raised a child, I absolutely realize that all the books that concentrate on early childhood are absolutely right. Uh, anybody here have a child five or under? You know, I, you learn it, you will learn it, but I wish more people had, uh, had emphasized it to me. Every, I, I regret every minute I didn't spend with my daughter before the age of five. You are the universe. Everything you get in there before the age of five is becoming part of who they are. Anything you fail to get in there, after five it will be harder. And once the eye-rolling years begin, forget it. <laughs> <clears throat> so before five is everything. You know, even meditation. This is, mommy, this is mommy's quiet time with God. Where, and, uh, children have, you know, I learned in my career, because I would do funerals and weddings, People would ask me, could I bring my, my child? And what I learned early in, in my work is that if there's a funeral, let's say, or a wedding, children have a natural sense of appropriateness. When something serious is going on, they don't know what it is, but they, they go naturally into a state if it's created. So even when, particularly when young mothers tell me, I don't have time to meditate right? Because I have small children at home. Well, first of all, if you meditate, and you know this from doing yoga, time expands. Time itself is malleable. Time is an aspect of consciousness, just as space is. So if I'm thinking deeper thoughts, and I'm moving from a deeper place, I will have more time, literally. Okay? If I'm frantic and shallow, and I don't have time, I don't have time, I won't have time. Right? So with children, especially in the before five, you know, and there's a lot now, there's the yoga for children, there's meditation for children, but also just, I know with my daughter, like I would just be home and I would notice 
Um, okay, this is, what do you, mommy, I'm meditating, okay. We be very quiet. God is here. <laughs> You know, it's just, it's amazing. They just grow up with it. And they're not, you know, a little one isn't going to sit there for a long time, but just even if they be can begin to get that in this room or in this space or at this time, it's a gift to our children. Even if you find that, you know, well, I open just to make sure, he, whatever. You know, you, so I think it's a great gift to our children. Now, after that, what I found as a mother, so first of all that, get everything in there before five. I wrote a book called Emma and Mommy Talk to God which is like four-year-old level. And what I learned as a mother, and you know, I, I, I'm sure some of you are like me, you're, how many have kids who are grown up? You know, at a certain point, the jury's in, and you kind of get where you got it wrong, and you get where you right, got it right. One of the, and I don't know anybody who said, oh, I got everything right. But um, one of the things that did work for me is that I didn't see spiritual instruction as something separate from the rest of life. It's whatever she was going through. Um, Okay, well, you need, oh my God, you need a miracle. Okay, let's pray for one. Or um, somebody acts mean at school and you say to your child, I bet it's not really happy for him at his house. I don't think it's happy. Do you think he's happy, you know? And then you say, and you talk about how, because I think, honey, I think if he was happy, like with his mommy and daddy, I don't think he would have acted that way. You know? And so they don't even know you're giving them spiritual instruction. You don't say, okay, now we're going to sit down and have Sunday school. It's just that you're teaching them to do what you're learning to do, which is deal with every situation from a higher perspective. Let's say a prayer. Let's pray for that. Oh, if he's, not, if he's acting that way, honey, I think we need to pray for him because I don't think he's happy at all. Let's pray. And you find and your children are learning to pray for someone who is mean for them. But you didn't say to them, this is Sunday school. Does that make sense? So you teach them from a very early age to simply practice the principles. And, and it's all as early, as early, as early. Does that make sense? Yeah. And after five, you're still the major dominant, but you, it's not like before five. It's so like what they say. Then after five, you're still dominant, and then once it's puberty, good luck to you. <laughs> <laughs> OK, who's next? OK, way up there in the back. <clears throat> guided lately to, um, I guess I have a community of people that I do work with and that I do give my time volunteer. What was the beginning of your sentence, people who? Well, I'm, uh, um, I've been guided to sort of expand a little bit and look at other countries and how I can <coughs> be part of the solution, Okay. Um, like in Syria, in Africa. Right. And I just wondered if you had any um, sort of practical recommendations, because I'm just starting to look at this, and I know you can sponsor children in other yes. countries. And um, like, are there, you know, I do pray for parts of the world that um, there are conflicts, but I feel like when I do it at home on my couch, like I'm very much alone in it. And right. I know that I'm not. I know there's people all over the world that are in the solution. Well, you know, you bring up a very interesting issue. Obviously, when it comes to someplace like Syria, there is no action, you know, that any of us can take specifically. Um, it's not your country or mine. I don't know if you're Canadian. Canada and the United States are not the problem in, in, in Syria. Uh, and the Western nations, our hands are being tied, and that Russia and China and blah, blah, blah. Now, first of all, let's not underestimate what we are doing and the effect that we are having when we pray for people in Syria. But also, let's take it back to where we were at the beginning, which is collective work. And the collective work is not only external, but the collective work is prayer work. And idea share is, um, uh, is um, stronger when it is shared. So let's take an example. Let's talk about the Israelis and the Palestinians. OK? Now, this is the deal. From a transpersonal perspective, the Israelis and the Palestinians are two victims of abuse. Here's a victim of abuse, the Israeli, who was victimized by the Holocaust. <clears throat> Here's the victim of abuse, victim, by the Palestinian, victimized by the Israeli. So you have two victims of abuse. 
Now, we all know from spiritual healing, until I have healed my own issue, I'm not at a place where I can stand in the presence of your pain. It's like my pain's too big, sorry. I'll have compassion for you when I get over my stuff, right? Now, I, for me personally, I, I can't blame either an Israeli or a Palestinian given their historical circumstances. Now, I also understand that from where they are, the trigger would be too great. By the way, there are many people among the Palestinians and the Israelis who, you know, as the American ambassador to Israel said to me, the, the majority of Israelis and the majority of Palestinians do not hate each other. They fear each other, but they do not hate each other. What you have there is what we have in many places, including the United States, where a small group of haters are exerting a lot of force. Okay? So, all minds are joined from a spiritual perspective. So if I'm an Israeli or I'm a Palestinian, I'm not psychologically able to lift up to the level of I love you in an unconditional way and I see that you're my brother in God. You and I can though. And all minds are joined. And anytime anybody's mind makes a shift, it's like a wave in the ocean. We're like, the Course in Miracles says, we're like waves in the ocean thinking we're other waves. We're like sunbeams to the sun thinking we're separate from other sunbeams. Really, there's no place where you stop and I start. So, if you think of yourself as just a little wave surrounded by a huge ocean, you can't possibly feel very powerful. But if I realize I'm a wave and I'm one with the ocean, then not only do I get to feel powerful, but I also get to realize that every movement I make affects the entire ocean. We now know that when a butterfly flaps its wings in the South Pole, it affects the, the wind currents in the North Pole, right? So anytime you and I think differently, it affects the sunship. This is the metaphysical meaning of the line, there is only one begotten son. The traditional Christians take that to mean the only begotten son of God is Jesus. To the metaphysicians, there is only one begotten son means we're all it. Are you with me? Now, so, we're going to do a meditation now. We're going to go inside the power of the inner mind. Now, this is what we're going to do. On the earth plane, physical eyes, here's the Israeli and here's the Palestinian. Well, what we have gotten to between the Israelis and the Palestinians is where we've gotten to with a lot of situations in the world. The mortal mind has taken the situation as far as we can take it. We need a miracle. Are you with me? Once again, Einstein's the problems of the world will not be solved on the level of thinking we were at when we created them. My physical senses show me the Israeli here. My physical senses show me the Palestinian here. They are separate. And in their separation and in their identification with the separate self, i.e., the history of my people, my separate self, no, the history of my people, my separate self. Are you with me? We are getting to a point as a human race where to the extent to which we see ourselves as separate, we cannot live in peace. Once again, if we see ourselves as one with the universe, hello, you with me? Okay, now, there's a deeper level. There's a world beyond what the physical eyes can see. And the entire mortal world is like a veil in front of what is true. So on the physical plane, here's the Israeli and here's the Palestinian. But on the level of deep reality, beneath the mortal shell, there is the truth of who the Israeli is. Beneath the mortal shell, there is the truth of who the Palestinian is. And even though on the realm of the body, I'm here and you're there, on the level of spirit, like I said, we're like sunbeams to the sun thinking we're separate from others. On the level of the, Isra of the, of the spirit, the, spirit the, so the light does not stop at the body but actually extends outward. So the Israeli doesn't stop at the body of the Israeli, it extends outward. And the spirit in the Palestinian does not stop at the level of the body but extends outward. So the reality is you've got the light of the Palestinian over here, the light of the Israeli over here. This is reality. You with me? That's not ultimate reality, separate self, Israeli. That's not ultimate reality, separate self, Palestinian. The ultimate reality is here. Now, as I said, I can get why the Israeli has a hard time with that and would go, huh? I get why the Palestinian would have a hard time with that and go, huh? They can't, but we can. It's easier for us because we're not there. It's easier for us, us because we're not them. 
It's easier for us. It's, it's always like that. When you have a deep problem, it's easier for me to speak principle to you because I'm not in your circumstance. So you might say to me, well, it's easy for you to say. And I go, that's why I'm saying it. <laughs> and I, if I'm, I, none of us can priest ourselves. It's true for me too. My quote unquote knowing theory, if I'm in my own circumstances, I need someone else. I actually had a therapy session once where I, uh, the therapist said to me, um, well, Marianne, like if someone came to you, what would you say? And I went, oh, that is so true. Okay, now this is what you say to me. I'll say it, and then you repeat it back to me. You need to say it to me. And she did it. And she said, well, that was great. Why didn't you just say that to yourself? I said, none of us can priest ourselves. We can know it, but the word spoken, when someone is, it, it's a profound thing, isn't it? I know those of you who are therapists, et cetera, know this. Okay, so as we go into that place in a meditative space, and to that place where the Israeli and the Palestinians are one, and we see it with our inner eye. We are literally helping to create synapses in their brains that right now, due to their mortal identification, they themselves cannot get to. Does that make sense? But once again, ma'am, and this is why what you're saying is so important, the fact we're going to do it in a room together gives it a force it would not otherwise have. You know, when we think of a terrorist, we are scared. When we think of a few of them together, we're really scared. That's because we instinctively know that there is this attrition of force in numbers. You know, I cannot imagine a kind of sort of casual, you know, sometimes when it's convenient, committed terrorist. These people are very serious about what they want. They have turned their hatred into a political force. And they have proven in horrifying ways that they will do whatever it takes to effectuate their worldview. Now, when it comes to love, I know many people, and I myself have been among them, kind of, sort of, you know, casually, sometimes when it's convenient, committed to love. So there are far more people in the world who love than who hate. But hatred has a perverse kind of courage. People hate with conviction today. The Course in Miracles says love produces miracles, but miracles are born of conviction. We need to love with the same level of conviction with which some people hate. We need to have the same kind of courage behind our love, the same kind of intention behind our love. We have, the, have to have the same kind of effectiveness behind our love and commitment behind our love that a few among us have behind their hate. And that's what I think is behind this whole thing of whether it's Sean Corns about uh, off the mat and uh, into the world or Sister Joanne or any others, that we now say, this is not just for me. This that I've experienced in my meditation, this that I've experienced in my yoga is now what I can take as my gift to the world. And you only get to keep what you give away. The Course in Miracles says, ideas do not leave their source. If I'm angry at you, I will feel the negativity, no matter what your response to me. And if I extend love to you, I will feel the blessing. If we now pray and, and me, end actually what we're doing here with a meditation that includes the Palestinians and the Israelis, we won't be hearing from any Palestinians and Israelis necessarily later in the day saying they're just in a more loving, more peaceful mood today. <laughs> but we will be in a more loving, peaceful mood because we showed up to help. Does that make sense? OK, anybody have anything to say before we do that final meditation? Any one last question or comment or anything we need to go to? OK, just that one comment or whatever. Yes, ma'am. <coughs> Thank you so much. Um, I just want to ask you about um, when you're talking about the athletes and their yes. emotional and psychological resilience and yes. strength. And um, discipline. Yes. How do we find that balance between you know, what they show us and you know, most of I don't want to say the world, but we're, we're struggling with emotional repression. Yes. And okay, good question. Know I know the answer. I know what you're saying. Okay. Yes. And I know the answer, but I'm saying I know the question. Yeah. Okay. This is an important issue, and I'm glad you brought it up. Because you're right. I love how the Course in Miracles says, look at the crucifixion, but do not dwell on it. There's a difference, though, there's a difference between denial and transcendence. If you just suppress the emotion, like you're saying, then you're just in denial. That's not helpful. Transcendence is where I have to feel it, 
because remember what we're talking about detox, I have to heal it, feel it in order to release it. What that is called is close friends. It's called people you trust. It's called whether it's a therapist, your loved one, the people you can let it all out with, even the people you let it all out with, doing it in a responsible, accountable way. The fact that I'm letting out my stress doesn't mean that that gives me permission to be angry at you. But if you love me and I love you and I know you're safe, I can be angry with you in your presence because I know you won't judge me for it. And I'm getting it up and out, right? Does that make sense? Not that it can be at you, right? But there is a, a temple space wherein you feel it, but you also know there's a point where that's enough. It go, you can feel that point, and once again, yoga is one of those things that helps us have that place within where we feel the difference between processing and spewing. I talked about it, I cried about it, I faced it, I processed it. That's enough, stop talking. You feel it, it's inside. It's like when you go shopping, and you know that you can afford to spend $50. Spending $50 and you know you can afford it can be fun. Spending $100 when you know you can't afford it, it feels a key, right? You can feel this is why we do things like yoga so that you, and, and meditation and all these things that we do to a certain point. It's processing and I know I went through something and I was very upset about it. I felt betrayed by a friend. I felt blah, 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 blah. We walked out of this place. I said to my friends, did you hear that? Was that just me or did she say blah, blah, blah? And I was really, I couldn't even believe it. I've been nice to this one. I can't believe it, blah, blah, blah. And one of the men, a uh, close friend said, okay, call me next week if you need to like process this. I said, no, I did. I mean, I let it out. I knew I was with friends. I had to like have my reaction, but I also knew when it, you just feel when it's time to bite your tongue. You feel when it's time. Enough is enough. And, that, and after that, you're giving it energy. Until that point, you're doing what needs to be done. After that point, no, you're fueling it and you're getting something off the victimization here or whatever. Does that make sense? So the healthy person does have to acknowledge, look at the crucifixion, do not dwell on it. Because you don't want to be one of those people, I'm not angry. I don't get angry. I've been meditating and doing yoga for years. This, these are dangerous, dangerous people. <laughs> that just means I carry my knife behind my back. <laughs> right? That makes sense? Does that sound real? Okay, you ready for this final meditation? Thank you very much. It's been lovely being with you. For those of you in your uh, yoga practice, um, in this conversation that is now up, I hope those of you in the United States will check out sistergiant.com. If you're not on my mailing list, I hope that, and you're interested in when I uh, come around your neighborhood, etc., I hope that you'll sign up on marianne.com or at the book table. Um, Sean Korn's uh, uh, organization, also, uh, obviously. But even short of the material activism, this spiritual activism is very important that we're about to do now. Martin Luther King said, we are materially passive, but we are spiritually active. The, the internal musculature, the Course in Miracles says that our greatest power to change our, the world is our power to change our mind about the world. And the Course in Miracles says, an agreement between two people is the most powerful force in the universe. Martin Luther King said there is a power inside us more powerful than bullets. So please remember that when we do the meditation that we're about to do, this is not just symbolism. This is not just metaphor. He says in The Course in Miracles, if you look at these ideas as merely symbols or merely metaphors, they will have the effect of, on your life of a symbol or a metaphor. But if you realize these are the forces that rule the universe, then they will move mountains in your life. So for those of you who have spiritual group, for those of you with your yoga practice, you might wish to begin something uh, where with other people practicing yoga, you actually include 10 minutes of meditation for peace on the world, sending love to those in Syria, doing exercises like we're about to do. Just see how that lives in your heart and see where it takes you, okay?
All right, and now uh, join with me and take a deep breath. <coughs> we close our eyes. <coughs> and now we see with our inner eye a beautiful light. And this light begins as a small light in the center of our heart and now extends outward <clears throat> to cover the entire inner vision of our mind. And now we see two people, one to the left of our inner vision and one to the right of our inner vision. To the left of our inner vision, the person that we see Israeli. And we know that behind this Israeli are all of the Israelis in the world. <clears throat> we look at the Palestinian to the right of our inner vision, and we know that behind the Palestinian, there are all of the Palestinians in the world. Looking again to our left, we look at the Israeli and we look at how this person dresses. We look at this person's physicality. We look at this person's mannerisms. And we begin by feeling any judgments that we might have. <clears throat> and we realize that our judgments do not help. that it is our capacity to love infinitely both Israelis and Palestinians, which serves them both. We surrender any judgments that we have. And now we look at the Israeli and we see the same little light that we felt in our own hearts, now in the heart of the Israeli. And we see that light begin to extend outward from the heart. And as we look at the body of the Israeli, we begin to see that the light fills the entire, entire body filled with light. And as the entire body fills with light, the body itself begins to fade. And the light begins to extend outward beyond the body, the great rays of light body itself, but shadow now in the presence of the truth, which is the light. <clears throat> now gently we turn our inner eye to the right, and we see the Palestinian, and we see how he or she looks, his or her clothes, his or her mannerisms, his or her speech, his or her behavior, and any opinions we have, we now surrender to God with blame or with pity, victimization, anything. Our outer emotions do not serve. We surrender to God and ask only to see infinite love, to see with the eyes of spirit and to embrace this person with all our love. And now we see a little light in the heart of the Palestinian. And now we witness as this light begins to expand, to grow in intensity, in brilliance, and the light begins to extend until now it fills the entire body of the Palestinian. the entire body now filled with light. And as the body itself is filled with light, the body itself begins to fade. For all we see is this great extraordinary light that now extends outward beyond the body. The great rays of light that extend from the heart, the spirit, the soul of the Palestinian extending outward beyond the body, the body itself now mere shadow. And now slowly, 
we turn our inner eye into the center of our inner vision. And we see to the left that the light of the Israeli has extended past the body, now into the center. The light of the Palestinian now extending past the body. And in the center, the lights merge. And the light of the Israeli and the light of the Palestinian, the truth of who they are, the spiritual reality on this level, the only truth, they are one. And we simply bear witness. We simply see this with our inner eye. We bear witness to a deeper truth from which a new level of problem solving will emerge. A new consciousness from which new manifest realities can now emerge. And we pray for infinite blessings upon them both. And here in this space where we contain the light of the universe and bring down the light of the universe, we ask that it extend through our minds to bless all living things. And in this moment, we pour a massive light, a massive love, a massive blessing, a massive protection on the people of Syria. We extend our hearts and our love to all those who suffer, anywhere for any reason. We realize in this moment that this compassion extended into the world is who we are. The righteous or right use of the mind. May we be vessels of light which heals our psyches. May we be vessels of light that heals our bodies. May we be vessels of light that cast out darkness wherever we engage it in our minds and hearts. And may the inner peace that we receive be a peace for all the world. And so it is, we all say, amen. Namaste. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you.